Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing pretty well. How are you? Pretty good. Yeah? Yeah. We just, we spent like 10 minutes watching a turtle walk around in my yard before. (laughs) Yeah. Or swim around in my yard. Well, he started walking, ended up swimming. Yeah. Question whether he may be drowning, but. (laughs) I hope not. It's a turtle. I mean, he's a little bitty turtle, though. (laughs) Do turtles drown? I don't think turtles can drown. I mean, I guess they can drown. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure they swim. Yeah. I mean, he looked like he was getting by, but. Yeah. I don't know. I just assumed this gender. It looked like a boy to me, but. His shell was literally like an inch and a half across, though. It's a tiny little thing. I told you, you should have went and got it for a pet. I, yeah. No, I, I don't, I don't think my cats would ever let it rest. You don't think so? No. Unless, yeah. except for when he was like actually curled up in a shell. Right. He and just, even then, they're probably batting him around on the floor and yeah. so forth and. They can make a mess. Sounds like a good life. Both the cats and the turtle can make a mess. <laughs> and the two together, I, just, I don't want to deal with that. I don't know. Opportunity lost. Yeah. I mean, I could keep him uh, in a box, like a, not a box, he like a little a box bitty turtle. box. Well, he probably is a box turtle. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the other ones that I've found in my backyard have been box turtles. Have they? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, like a, a pin. That's probably a better <laughs> okay. way of saying it. Not, <laughs> right. not like put him in a little box. I mean, like, you know. Yeah. Big six, box. By, six by six pin or something. That's where we used to keep them in when I was a kid. Yeah. And they eat grapes. Well, they eat all kinds of stuff. But yeah. I like the way they eat grapes. Yeah. Because they only eat the pulp. Oh, so they like... Dude, I had a squirrel when I was a kid, mm-hmm. and it did that. So it would peel the, the skin off uh-huh. and then just eat the middle. Yeah. And we'd always find the inside out grape yeah. skins. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I th- I never saw them do it but i always had the idea just because of the size of their heads that they just like ate their way in one side and then when they pulled their head out it turned the skin inside out i'm sure that's not actually how it worked but that's how <laughs> that's it worked how in my head pictured it, yeah. Right? yeah this is a funny image to uh, me no teensy my squirrel used to it would just peel it like would start from the the top where you pull it and just like pick the little skins off your squirrel's named teensy teensy yeah okay i had a squirrel named teensy as a kid mm. that used to eat grapes like bob ross did you keep him in the pocket? No, the he pocket would. Squirrel? He would. He would sit on your shoulder, though. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Cool. So we we never took possession, I guess, of any of the squirrels that that we hung out with. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. We had some in the backyard that would um, that were friendly, though. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and we had one like parade a bunch of newborn squirrels in front of our back door and like stop them in front of our back door while we sat there. <laughs> so you, know, you, eyes wide. you see, yeah. Like, look what I did. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> well done. <laughs> <Right>. Congratulations. <laughs> Continuing on the species. Good luck with the next generation. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, okay. I don't know where to start. There's a lot going on in the world. I guess so. Um, all right. So I have just kind of a little story that I wanted to comment on because this is kind of at its end, right? The the uh, is um, pro Palestinian protests on the colleges. Oh, I said this end for now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, it could start back. Well, that's true. Not likely through the summer, though. I suspect. Mm, yeah. Well, yeah. I guess school will be out. Mm-hmm. So now they're going to take it to their hometowns. Yeah, maybe. I heard there was a uh, big protest in Foley not far from us today. Really? No, I didn't hear about that. Or No, it was yesterday that I heard about it. I guess it was maybe on the weekend or something. Ah. I don't know. Kind of a shame we missed it. Like, I would go to something like that just to talk to people. Yeah, see if they understood what they were protesting. It would be interesting. I, like, I would do that. Like, like if, no, 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 I agree with you. I just want to know if know you why. understand. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Explain some things to me. <laughs> No. If you hear about another one, like I say, let them know. Well, like, I, I go. I mean, like, I didn't know about it in advance. It's yeah. just, I'm just saying, if you hear one, something. Yeah. Uh, I didn't even know it happened. I was kind of surprised. Yeah. But I'm not. Like I say, I mean, there's really? definitely... Yeah. I don't know. It's like, we're a Baldwin small, County's, conservative... Yeah, Baldwin County is as small as it used to be, and it's no, definitely becoming more diverse. So, like I say, I mean, it, it doesn't. It, like I say, I mean, it doesn't surprise me. By more diverse, you mean more liberal white women? Uh, 
I don't know about I mean, which is probably a lot yeah. of the protesters, I'm guessing, like yeah. young liberal well, white women. But like you say conservative, and, and we are still extremely conservative down here, mm -hmm. but it's not as small down here as it used to be. And, and that leaves more, that weeds some of the conservatism out. Like it's still extremely conservative, but I would say it's not as conservative as it was 10 years ago. Oh, I bet it is. I mean, the wow. voting voting would suggest that it is. Well, the voting, I, yeah, I would probably agree with that. Um, I, I mean, there, this is what I would say, is that they're, it's probably just as conservative as it's always been, but there's a lot more liberals just because there's a lot more people. Yeah. No, and that's kind of, I guess that is kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah. So. Uh, so anyway, at the, before these protests ended, um, I just thought that this, uh, this character, Rebecca Weiner. I'm pretty sure that's how you say your name. <laughs> that's um, how you're saying it, right? That's how I'm saying it. <laughs> um, she was an adjunct professor at Columbia university. She's in the, um, the school of international and public affairs. Okay. All right. She was also on the New York police department's intelligence and counterterrorism bureau. And while she was a professor at Columbia and also working for the New York Police Department, uh, <laughs> she was reporting on students that were protesting. Yeah. Um, and a busy I, woman. I, yeah, I, I should have pulled the clip. There's a clip of her giving like a debrief. And there's some question about like, well, did the school know that you were also working for the New York Police Department at the <laughs> yeah. same time that you were a professor there? And so answer is probably, I, I mean, I don't know for certain, but probably. Yeah. Her resume does kind of read like a spook though. Yeah. Um, but the, what I should have pulled is the clip of her, um, doing a, a press conference or a, some sort of debrief. And she's saying, well, but these students had unacceptable ideas. <laughs> yeah. Like that, that, that is the problem. Yeah. yeah. That they have ideas that we just won't tolerate. Yeah. Which is not illegal <laughs> at all. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it's very much protected. <laughs> yeah. It's supposed to be from yeah. government intrusion. But anyway, um, and as I dug into this a little deeper, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this person, but um, as I dug into this a little deeper, I also found that her, well, okay, so first off, she's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Ah, Okay. We should just do an entire episode on the CFR sometime. <laughs> yeah. Because that is one creepy organization. Yeah. Um, you, like you worry about the, what is it, the Bilderberg Group or like some of those things, like the Council on Foreign Relations in this country. Yeah. Probably has a very outsized influence on government policy. Yeah. I mean, I... My my understandings is they're almost the arm of the government in their self. Yeah, it's not supposed to be though. No, I mean, I mean obviously it's not supposed to be, but it, they they act as one. Mm -hmm. So um, it's certainly been peopled with, um, with the kind of elites that have a lot of influence in this country anyway. Um, a lot of the big bankers, uh, you know, big big business, uh, military contractors, things like that. So. We ought, we ought to spend some time on that sometime because yeah. um, I, I think that that would be interesting and maybe eye-opening to some people. Yeah. So anytime you see somebody's a member of the CFR, immediately like be skeptical yeah. of their motives. This person has an agenda. By the way, Tulsi Gabbard used to be on CFR. Ooh, that's interesting. She's not anymore. Yeah. Well, maybe they decide, oh, we don't like your kind here. Yeah, I, that's <laughs> kind of what I think. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, the uh, so this this bureau that she worked for the for on the NYPD, the um, Intelligence and Counterterrorism Bureau. I also found that the New York Police Department's Intelligence and Counterterrorism Bureau maintains an office in Tel Aviv, Israel. Oh well, I'm sure they need that. Yeah, that you know. makes perfect sense. Why? <laughs> right. I mean, how are you going to protect New York from New York? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of Jews in New York, right? Maybe. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, yeah. so um, and there, there were stories that this group was reporting on Muslim activities in New York to Tel Aviv and like, yeah. anyway, 
just seems nefarious. Yeah, weird stuff. Yeah. Uh, and if you really want to be horrified, look up Viab sometime as long as we're on the Israeli influence in American politics thing, which I'm not, we're not really on. But I just, yeah. if you're interested, look up Viab, which is the Virginia Israeli Advisory Board that um, is a non-governmental lobbying group uh, at in the Virginia state legislature. I say in the a lobbying group to the Virginia state legislature that is uh, lobbying for um, special privileges for Israeli business um, at the expense of American business in the state of Virginia. Interesting. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Um, so anyway, this is kind of a, this is a weird character, this woman. Yeah. And I, I expect we're going to see her pop up again in some other roles in the future. Yeah, I would so think so. Remember that name, yeah. Rebecca Weiner. Can't Rebecca, that hard yeah, right. Can't, yeah. To, to forget. <laughs> um, years from now when she pops back up, people that listen to our podcast will be like, ah, <laughs> they called it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> right again. Yep. <laughs> uh, okay. What next? Well, all right. So we've been talking about going to talk about rent control for a while, and you said something had come up. Yeah, and I can't remember what it was now, but something Biden said in the speech, or I don't know. I saw something somewhere where they were talking about. I don't know. It was so much rent control, but it was like housing prices and uh, well, rent we control are may the, have been part of that. Though. Yeah, we are in the part of the uh, election year where the. Um, it's time to start giving stuff away. Yeah, where where the president, <laughs> the incumbent president, is now trying to bribe voters with whatever he can. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, especially since it looks like he's losing, or, yeah. or at least it's too close to call. Dude, at, yeah, at I best. Mean, some of, some of the polls are looking pretty pretty bleak for old Biden. Yeah, I saw something today or yesterday that he was that Trump was leading in like all of the major swing states. That he had a had a pretty substantial. Now that was polls where RFK was included, so it goes back to that whole theory that RFK is going to take more from Biden than Trump. Yeah, I th- which I'm is sure still an open question. Um, but well, um, based on his running mate choice, I think that RFK J is not really taken a lot of from votes Biden, from, from Trump. Trump yeah, at this yeah. point, so yeah. We'll see. I don't know what his purpose is in this. Yeah. And I don't... Um, so we had a Libertarian Party meeting the other day, two days ago. Yeah. And uh, and one of the guys was asking me about the possibility of RFKJ being the Libertarian candidate. There was a lot of talk about that for a while. Well, yeah. That, that's, that's all kind of subsided now. Well, his position on Israel kind of put it into that. that. Yeah. Um, if you're going to... I mean, if you're going to choose a non-libertarian to represent the Libertarian Party, he needs to at least be good on... Well, he has to be good on war. War. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, yeah and, and that's a real... Personal knowledge. freedom, I suppose, too. Like, uh, the economics we can maybe teach you. <laughs> yeah. But... Well, in a situation like that, he would have been specifically campaigning on certain things. Like that would have been the agreement that would have been came to yeah. is that that he would focus his campaign and we would back him according to certain issues, mm. you know. But war would have to be one of them. Like that's yeah, um, because initially he was good on all of that. Well, he's good on Ukraine. He's good on Ukraine, which at the time mm-hmm. for a while there was the war, but right. then everything happened in Israel and that changed. <laughs> so because people don't have principles, they have policies. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah. Oh well. All right. So speaking of uh, teaching him some economics. All right. Um, rent control. Yeah. And I think that what you you were talking about that they were putting caps on uh, bank fees. Oh yeah, yeah, that, that was, was one of the things. That was one of the things. Yeah, I, I yeah, don't Biden understand. Because Biden had a whole list of stuff that he was wanting to do, and um, yeah, I remember like, hearing about that one. Yeah, I, that's so ridiculous. Anyway, like if if you're if because it's about overdraft fees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like if your checking account is empty, like the size of the fee isn't really your problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, that's true. <laughs> Unfortunately, so I, I, like I, I don't know. I mean, the size of the fee is a problem. Yeah, but, but <laughs> it's but it's reducing not, the fee from thirty to eight dollars isn't going to solve your economic woes no. if your oh, bank account's empty. It's absolutely not. And <laughs> and these banks, they will find a way to make up that gap somewhere. Oh yeah, they're going to charge everybody for having an account. Yeah, 
Yeah. Which, Remember uh, when checking accounts used to be free? Well, I was going to say, um, last time I opened the banking ac- uh, check a new checking account, which was a few years ago now, mm-hmm. um, I had to shop around to yeah. find one. Like I found one that was a free account. I didn't have any like ties or requirements, but they all, you either had to have so much money coming into it regularly mm-hmm. or they charged you a fee every month. Yeah. Um, which actually what I found was a credit union. Um, because apparently yeah, that's, that's just common practice in the banking as far as banks go now is you don't have a free account, like mm-hmm. unless you have a lot of money coming into it, um, which this particular account I was trying to open, I didn't. Um, yeah, like, and I, I like I said, I wasn't going to open one if I couldn't find, I finally found the credit union. I saw, so I was at the bank today and they had, uh, their interest bearing money market accounts. Yeah. And the amount of interest that you got was based on the size of the account, of course. Yeah. And so it was like everything was between like 0.45% and 0.6% up to $100,000. Yeah. Um, and then at 100000 or more dollars, it was 3%. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> like if you're going to park $100,000 here, we'll pay you a real interest yeah, rate. Yeah, we'll actually pay you something for yeah. it. But beyond that, like don't even bother. <laughs> because how do banks make money? Yeah. They by, make money by lending out money. Yeah, by having money to lend out. Yeah. yeah. So if you're going to, if you're like putting $100,000 in there with the intent of it, earning interest for a while. Yeah. They can make a lot more than 3% off of it. Yeah. So especially now. Yeah. Although I did roll over an investment at better than 5% interest, which isn't, isn't fantastic, but over the last few years, it's good. Yeah. 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 I mean, you can't look for, you're not going to get much better than that. I know. And I don't have time to play the market. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Like I could do better in the market, but that's so time consuming. Yeah. I mean, that becomes a second job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and when I was doing it, I was coming home and spending hours. Mm-hmm. So I'd, you know, I'd do my eight ish, eight or more hours at work, and then I'd come home and spend three more hours looking at, <laughs> yeah, reading, at, at uh, looking at stock, and um, stocks, and yeah, yeah, stock charts, graphs, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. And that's, it just, that's no way to live your life. Yeah, it's some, I was like, <laughs> I, was a, I was decent at it. Yeah. But um I just didn't care enough and it just felt like it felt like a chore. Yeah. It wasn't at first it was fun and then it was like a chore. Yeah. And Once you kind of got a feel for it, it was kind of like, oh, this isn't fun anymore now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I've got it figured out. I'm actually like not making as many bad moves. Yeah. But even well, it's not hard to like line things up so that you always win more than you lose. It's, it is gambling. Yeah. Um and it's uh, unfortunately it's a gambling that's been forced by the monetary policy of this country because you can't do better than inflation anywhere else and nope. the government has decided for some reason that the way to prop up the economy is to prop up the stock market but really that just benefits the the investor class not working people yeah i mean they give it the excuse of well if we don't prop up the stock market then the, these working class people will lose all their retirement and so forth but i probably wouldn't need retirement investments like that if the money was stable. <laughs> exactly. If I could just put money back and know it wasn't going to lose its value. Yeah. Because that's that's what you're up against. Like right. anything you save, I mean, you're you're really only hurting yourself because that you just throw it in a bank. Yeah. Because it loses 2 to 3% of its value every, every year. Every year, exactly. And think of that over the course of a lifetime. Yeah. You know, over the course of a lifetime, you've lost more than half of your of the value of your income. Yeah, exactly. So, which is the reason I'm a big believer in um precious metals. Like, yeah. So that's where Yeah, that's if you're saving in dollars. Yeah. If you're yeah. saving in silver and gold, it's not quite the same or or any kind of commodity really. Yeah. Yeah. Um real estate, what have you. Yeah. I mean, that's really the way to go as far as saving. Mm-hmm. And then you can do it, like I say. Yeah. <clears throat> Take some discipline. It does. But Back to rent control. Back to rent control. We're going we're gonna to get to this at some point. Yeah. It's, <laughs> someday we will finally talk about rent control. We've only been teasing it for a month. Yeah. And that day is today. And that day is today. Right. All right. So um, rent control is, of course, when there's legislative caps on increases in rent. Yeah. Uh, just as baseline. Like a lot of big cities do it um, with the excuse that they need to do it to maintain 
uh, affordable housing for lower and middle class people. Yeah. But it creates problems. What so, kind of the problems would that create? Like the government's <laughs> interfering in the market. Only good things can happen then, right? right. <laughs> of course. I mean, if history has taught us anything, is that Remember, government sarcasm inter- <laughs> doesn't come through on an audio podcast. I don't know, man. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> if you say it just right, <laughs> right? Um, okay. Well, because uh, you have reduced the possibility of profits on low and middle income um, apartments. Yeah. By limiting the charges that, or the increase in charges on rent. Um, you've destroyed all incentives to improve the apartments. Yeah. Um, adding wood floors or, you know, fancy countertops in the kitchen or any other kind of improvements. <laughs> or, or having heating and cooling. Or ha- Well, we'll get to that kind of <laughs> thing too. Yeah. All right. So there, you, you also destroy the incentive to maintain yeah. Apartments. Exactly. Um, because there's no profit to be had. And you can't charge extra rent to make up for the cost of improving anything or repairing even, even anything. Even maintaining, yeah. Um, so there's just no incentive to do so. Um, you destroy the incentives uh, for um, new middle yeah. and inco- which, low which income r- apartments. Uh, apartment complex which really is the crux of the problem yeah. because what you're trying what you're trying to do with the rent control is create more places good places for people to stay but by controlling the rent there's less reason for people to build those new places because it's it's all a supply and demand issue mm-hmm. uh, the reason the rent's so high to begin with is because there's not enough places except that you've artificially lowered the price yeah so if you artificially lower the price, um, then the demand increases. Yeah. But the supply, supply decreases. decreases. Exactly. And so it's it's even, it gets worse, of course, than even that it destroys any incentive for producing new or constructing new uh, low and middle income apartment complexes. Uh, you also incentivize the conversion of the existing low and middle income apartment complex uh, into, to to be used for other things into other uses. Um, you incentivize conversion of, uh, low and middle income apartments into luxury apartments because they're usually not, they don't have rent control. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, you incentivize converting low and middle income apartments into condominiums. Yeah. Which requires a much bigger initial capital investment, uh, from people, right? Cause you have to put a, um, you're buying it like a house, so you have to put a down payment, yeah, or pay extravagant uh, interest rates, yeah. Um, or there's no uh, rent control on office space, yeah. So you incentivize cons- converting them into office space instead, yeah. I mean, prices tell um, landowners where the best what the best use of their property is. And if you artificially lower the price for one thing, you incentivize its use for other things. For something else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so as on the whole, it actually reduces the amount of available housing. Yep. uh, And with that decreased supply, prices go up. Yep. And if you can't actually raise the prices, then just the supply goes down. Then the supply goes away. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, that's that's the real problem of rent control, and it's happened over and over and over again. And somebody put out a um, oh gosh, was it on a website? I just saw it referenced, so I, I'm I don't have personal experience with this, but where they were they were posting pictures of urban decay, I guess you would say. Yeah. And, um, from various places at various times. And the, it was a, it was a Boolean choice. Like, is this the result of war or rent control? Yeah. (laughs) I bet it was hard to tell the difference between the two. It was in fact hard to tell the difference between the two. (laughs) Yeah. Like people, people struggled like to decide. And the fact that there's a similarity there. Tells a is lot. indicative, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and that well, was when I was reading a bunch about rent control a month ago. That was one of the quotes I came across. I just don't remember who said it now. Yeah, as he said, the most effective way of destroying 
um, an urban environment is through rent control, except maybe bombs. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Wild. Yeah. Which I've heard stories of like landlords just completely abandoning the property. Mm -hmm. Like just because there's there, they can't afford to keep it up. They can't afford to do anything with it. Like they just, they can't even afford to sell it. Like it's right. just, it's, they can't sell it. They can't afford to keep it up. Yeah. It's nothing but loss to them. They just walk away. They just walk away from it. Yeah. And the other thing that it does is that, um, wealthy people will just acquire more property. Yeah. You know, you'll, you'll end up with a, a, a rich businessman that has four rent controlled apartments that he uses. Yeah. Um, you know, like have three of them for living space and one of them for office space and won't give them up cause they're rent controlled. Yeah. Now is that, is that the best use of those four apartments is for this one guy yeah. or would they be better <laughs> used to have families in them at higher prices? Yeah. Well, um, Which the prices wouldn't be so high if we weren't controlling the rent and people could build them freely. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Um, this seems like a good time. There's been a, a clip going around from a modern monetary theory documentary of uh, Jared Bernstein. Um, ah, the name says it all. We must <laughs> we must be fixing to learn a lot about economics. I'm, yeah. ex I'm excited. I'm going to go ahead and play the clip and then I'm going to say what he what his role is. All right. <laughs> Like you said, they print the dollars. So why, why does the government even borrow? Well, um, the, uh, so the, I mean, again, some of this stuff gets some of the language that the MM, some of the language and concepts are just confusing. I mean, the government definitely prints money and it definitely lends that money, which is why uh, the government definitely prints money and then it lends that money by, uh, by selling bonds. Uh, is that what they do? They, they, um, they, yeah, they, they, um, they sell bonds. Yeah, they sell bonds, right? Because they sell bonds and people buy the bonds and lend them the money. Yeah. So a lot of times, a lot of times, at least to my ear with, with MMT, the, the language and the concepts can be kind of unnecessarily confusing, but there is no question that the government prints money and then it uses that money to, um, uh, 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 so, um, yeah, I, I guess I'm just, I don't, I can't really talk. I, I don't, I don't get it. I don't know what they're talking about. Like, cause it's like the government clearly prints money. It does it all the time and it clearly borrows. Otherwise we wouldn't be having this debt and deficit conversation. So I don't think there's anything confusing there. Okay. This guy is the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors to the president. Man, we got some sharp people up there, let yeah. me tell you. Biden's My, in good hands, fellas. Yeah. Like, I'm just saying. <laughs> My favorite part is when he says it's all very confusing, and then he ends it with saying it's not confusing at all. <laughs> right. I, and I'll be honest, when I first listened to it, I was like, well, of course this guy can't explain modern monetary theory. Nobody can explain modern monetary theory because it's stupid. Yeah, well, because it's wrong. <laughs> it's it's inexplicable. Yeah, inexplicable. Um, <laughs> the idea that debts don't matter, that you can just print to your heart's content, etc. But then you have to you have to go back and you have to think like this guy. This guy's asking the interviewer at some point, "Is that how we make money? Is that like how bonds? Well, he asks how bonds work. Right? He's like, yeah." Because he kind of explains it, and then he's like, that's how bonds work, right? Yeah, he's so unsure of himself. Now, it turns out this guy actually has a degree in music, not in economics, but it doesn't really matter. Like, that's not really the point. Yeah. I mean, it, there could be a point to be made there that the a guy the with a degree position. in music is the chairman of the economic advisory board. Yeah. But leaving that aside, the other thing I thought after I got past the just modern monetary theory is stupid and what an idiot this guy sounds like after he's stops and starts and sputters and stutters and yeah. whatever. Clearly is, yeah, doesn't have the answer. Is that even if he had the answer, he yeah. couldn't give it. Yeah. Because anybody that heard how money is actually created in this country would be like, mm, wait a minute here. <laughs> yeah. This guy's got power. <laughs> so the answer, I'm going to explain it to everybody where yeah. money, money comes from. Yeah. The answer is that money in this country, fiat currency as it exists today, exists only through debt. Yeah. There's nothing to back it. 
It is worth nothing at all except whatever faith, except the full faith and credit of the federal government of the United States. Now, how much faith in and credit do you give to the United States <laughs> government, first off? So that should be your first question. But this is what happens. When, let's say that the government has, uh, has been invoiced $1,000 for some service. Yeah. They have a $1,000 liability to pay this invoice. What they do to pay that invoice is they, they issue um, treasury bonds. Okay. So they say they issue a $1,000 treasury bond. Yeah. Which is, uh, he says, sells bonds. Yeah. Like it's a product. Yeah. But it's not really a product. It's an IOU. Yeah. So what the bond is, is the government says, you give me $1,000 now and I'll give you $1,000 plus interest at some time in the future. Yeah. And then I'm going to use the $1,000 that you give me now to pay my liability for $1,000 to this other guy. Okay. So you've created a liability. Yeah. To pay a liability. Yeah. All right. There's no credit there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not even like it balances out to zero. No. Yeah. It's like it balances out to a negative. It balances out to a negative. Yeah. So now you've paid a thousand dollars here and owe a thousand and whatever Just dollars say here. Just fifteen hundred. Yeah. 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 It wouldn't be that much. Say at eleven hundred. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Um. So the the whole creation of money comes out of debt, and it's actually worse than that too. <laughs> yeah. It is. Um, because that thousand dollars that you use to pay that invoice, yeah. that guy, he takes it and he goes and puts it in a bank. Yeah. Now at a 10% reserve rate, reserve requirement yeah. means that when the bank takes that thousand dollars, they keep a hundred dollars of it to cover the reserve requirement. Yeah. And then they lend out the other 900. Yeah. For something else. Okay. So then whoever, wherever that money goes eventually into a bank, yeah. that bank takes that $900, keeps 90 of it to cover their reserve requirement and lends out $810. <laughs> and this just keeps which going finds its on. way into a bank, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. So that thousand dollars that you created mm -hmm. through owing somebody else more than a thousand dollars is used to create $10,000. Yeah. All of debt. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's wild. <laughs> and that's how money's created in this country. Well, and then you still have to print the money to pay off the bondholder, right? Eventually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, like at that, some point, there's going to be money created to do that. Which is why this is like a feedback loop, and it just yeah. keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And the the worst thing about it is that it, the 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 speed at which this happens has accelerated tremendously. Yeah. So in 2008, the M1 money supply calculation was like one and a half trillion. Yeah. Um, then in 2019, it was like three trillion. It had doubled in, in those uh, 10, roughly, roughly 10, years. 10 years. Yeah. Then COVID happened. Yeah, it did. And now the M1 money supply is more than 20 trillion. And then you wonder why. So it went why. from 3 trillion to more than 20 trillion in just a couple of years. Yeah. And you wonder why people can't afford to buy McDonald's. Right. And it's because inflation works because the money supply has increased, but the amount of goods and services has not. Yeah. And in fact, in COVID, it actually Decreased. reduced. Yeah. yeah. Um, but to try and make it as simple as possible. And I'm sure a lot of people have heard this before, but if you haven't, this is the easiest way to understand why everything costs more. Yeah. It's not because of greedy capitalists. It's because you have a whole lot more dollars going yeah. after the same amount of goods. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's only one option there. The prices have to go up. Yeah. Because you got to, you're, you start outbidding. Yeah. Exactly. Like who's who's it more valuable to? Yeah, exactly. Um, why sell something for a hundred dollars when you can get a hundred and ten for it? Yeah, consistent well, and well, still sell and, out. Well, and you still need that mm -hmm. because you you need that extra money to produce that good. Like so. Well, it's, that's true too. You know, because that's but even that's if you where, didn't, that's where Biden with, with his last this announcement they made because he was talking about particularly with the bank fees and stuff like that that he's blaming the greedy capitalist. It's like it's not the greedy capitalist, like that's it. 
the the pro the cost of all of the production and everything that goes in is going up with inflation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, their input costs are higher too. Yeah. Their labor costs are slightly higher. Yeah. Yeah. The, the labor is not keeping up with the mm -hmm. rest. I can assure you of that. No. Well, it's because the, the inflation benefits the moneyed classes. Yeah. And like I said earlier, the, um, the federal reserve has decided that the way to control the money supply isn't through directly controlling the money so supply. It's through controlling interest rates, yeah. but they, Controlling interest rates is really an excuse, or I guess the mechanism that they use to control the interest rates is the money supply. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, you know, if you decrease the money supply, then you um, incentivize uh, lower interest rates. If you increase the money supply, then you incentivize higher interest rates because the banks have to work harder to get. No, actually, I have that backwards. I was going to say, Sorry. you need to flip that, yeah. right? No, I have that backwards. Yeah. Um, because the more money is available, the more banks can profit. So yeah. they, um, with a higher money supply, lower interest rates. And yeah. since they're always trying to push for lower interest rates these days with the economy being like it is, yeah. they just keep increasing the money supply. Yeah. Which is the reason the rates were so low after 2008. Like mm -hmm. that's like, It's because like they doubled the money supply. And, yeah. yeah. So. At, because most of that increase from one and a half to three trillion happened like yeah. in a couple of years after 2008. Yeah, exactly. Um, Cause the, the economy crashed and they were trying to do something to spur it back up. Yeah. And um, the idea is that if you just put a bunch of money out in the economy, that, that, that creates economic activity, which in some ways it does. Yeah. But it, what it, <laughs> it also results in a whole lot of waste. Yeah. Um, you know, people are suddenly flush and said so they're doing things with their money that they wouldn't normally do with their money. Yeah. I mean, well, you, there, well, there were stories from back, like back in the time, um, like, Oh gosh, I'm trying to think of, of when the example was from, I was reading some David Stockman stuff recently and he was talking about, or was it Stockman? Might not have been. I was reading recently. Somebody, anyway, yeah. um, that, uh, and I think it was in Germany. Um, when they increase the money supply, it might be Weimar Republic times yeah. of Germany where they increase the money supply so much. And, um, so people had gone from, there was somebody who's, um, relating the story about that. They, they were a big music lover and they liked to go to the opera. Um, and then suddenly instead of being able to just go and buy a ticket and go into the opera, they're waiting in these long lines to get into the opera and their ticket costs so much more and it turns out that a, a lot of the people at the opera, they're not even music lovers. They just have money to spend. <laughs> yeah, it's something to go do, right? Yeah, they're just consuming for the sake of consuming. Yeah. but Which is great for the opera house. Briefly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, until they can't, you know, afford their actors or to their rent yeah. or, you know, to make costumes anymore or whatever else it happens to be. Yeah. Or suddenly that that money just doesn't isn't enough to buy a ticket anymore. Yeah. Um or people can't afford fuel to get there or whatever it happens to be. It, in the end the increase in money supply is just a loss to to the majority of people. Yeah. Um now the moneyed classes benefit cuz they get the money first. Mm -hmm. If you get the money first, you get to spend it while it's still at its full value before inflation really hits. Exactly. By the time it trickles down to the working classes the money's worth a lot less than it was. Yeah, because it's already infiltrated the system. Yeah, it started circulating and and um, has bid up prices. So, so kind of go into some of this. So, like we've seen hyperinflation all over the world throughout time. Like mm -hmm. it, it's one of those things that happens. But it just seems kind of crazy to me the situation we're in right now here in the U.S. because our currency just happens to be the reserve currency. For the world. Mm -hmm. So if there is some kind of crash or anything like that, like how is that going to affect? It's not just going to affect us here at home. Like, so now what we're doing, manipulating our currency the way we are, like we're affecting everybody. Yeah. Um, well, the, you're creating another incentive. Yeah. Which is for um, countries that have U.S. currency mm -hmm. to exchange it for something else. 
to get out of it. Yeah, to send it back to the U.S., which yeah. again increases the money supply here in the U.S. that much more. Exactly. Uh, driving inflation up that much more. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a real recipe for disaster here. And and you're looking at some competition coming up too with BRICS. Yeah. And BRICS is talking about creating a real hard currency as well, yeah. a gold-backed currency. Oh, wow. Um, so, I mean, I can see I can see the U.S. losing reserve status. Now, unfortunately... We'll I, never let that happen. I can't see the U.S. losing reserve status without a fight. Yeah. Well, that's, that's kind of, and that kind of goes back to what I was going to say earlier is like the U S dollar is backed by something. Yeah. The U S military. Exactly. (laughs) Like that's, that's what's supporting it. But if, if you can't pay your soldiers yeah, and then of course you need wheelbarrows of money to do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess you can always pay them in commodities. You can pay them in food and whiskey and I don't know, women, (laughs) whatever. Um, Foreign women. (laughs) Maybe. Uh, That's probably something we shouldn't even laugh about. Um, But you also have the problem that we talked about last week. If if we eliminate conscription entirely, like how many people are going to go fight for that, really? Depends on how good the propaganda is. I guess that's true. But let me tell you, as of as of right now, like the mm-hmm. propaganda is getting weaker and weaker. Well, like, that's true. But we, the the other side that you have of that is that if people are starving because the dollar isn't worth anything, and you believe that the answer is to go kill some people to keep the value of the dollar up, yeah, you're gonna have people signing up. Yeah, um, but then they won't be producing anything at home, which means that we'll be getting that much poorer here. Yeah, I don't know. I, I that's uh, that's it's, a, it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, it's, <laughs> like, I, I can't see I can't see this ending well. Yeah, like I don't I don't see a way that here that that this ends nicely. Short of a libertarian taking office, so there is an answer. Yeah, well, even a libertarian is going to have a hard time. It would require a currency conversion back to hard currency. Yeah. Which would be a shock to the system. Absolutely. I mean, but we can we can look at an example in Argentina right now. Yeah. With Millet um, converting to U.S. dollar, uh, but I mean, it's a thing that's going to take place in stages over time or, or whatever. And there's already been some problems, but there's al- also already been some improvement. Some improvement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's whether people can just like hang on long enough to like really let it play it out. It out. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, I do think that they'll end up in a better place. Uh, and I think that there's enough people now that also believe that they're going to end up in a better place. Yeah. It, or at the very least think, well, what we've been doing hasn't worked. Let's try something else. <laughs> well, people do seem to be a lot more open-minded as far mm-hmm. as like solutions because... Uh, well, if they've been living under a socialist system for so long and have been getting poorer and poorer yeah. and poorer and poorer and poorer. And we're moving there. Well, yeah. Well, that's kind of what I was getting at. I, I mean, mean, not if, to Argentina. We're, no, no, no. The yeah. U.S. is moving in that direction. Yeah. I'm not moving to Argentina. No, not yet, right? Not yet. <laughs> we'll see how well, it plays out. <laughs> exactly. If he gets reelected, I might be moving to Argentina. <laughs> yeah. Um, Beautiful no, but country. People in this country are becoming... I mean, we're not there, but like more open to different types of ideas and mm-hmm. and that type of thing just because we've watched for so long like the the power the the establishment just doesn't know what it's doing yeah well and you know pay attention now the this is something that i've been thinking about this is not on my notes but um this is something that i've been thinking about recently with um mike johnson's complete betrayal of his party and his constituents yeah so he had said over and over and over again, like, we are not going to send more money overseas until we have a plan to fix the border or we, <laughs> we have some concessions on the border. And then he let that... Completely uh, collapsed on it. Yeah. Then he let that uh, bill go to the floor where we're funding all these um, military, all this military adventurism <laughs> all over the place and didn't get anything for the border at all. Yeah. Now, he didn't do that until after primaries. Yeah, because he's smart. Because he's smart. And this is the this is probably the calculation. Yep. Is that okay, I'm already the Republican running for this office yep. since the primaries have passed. In the general election, I'm the Republican. 
And all those Republicans in my district, they may hate what I've done right now, yeah. but not enough to vote for the Democrat. Yep. And then I've got, I mean, I don't know how long their terms two are. Years two years in the House. So he's got a couple of years before for that to have went away. Yeah. And then he can do it all over again. Yeah. So this, um, this two-party system, this de facto two-party system has allowed all these quote-unquote representatives to completely ignore their constituents and even completely ignore their, their party's expressed ideology. I don't yeah. know how real any of that ideology is at this point, but their party's expressed ideology because the fear of the other side is so great that they'll still maintain their position. And so the truth is that they can do whatever they want. And when it suits them, which is really often in military adventurism and some other situations, yeah. they can completely betray their party on both sides. Oh yeah. And completely betray their constituents on both sides. And still get reelected because of the fear of the other guy. Yep, exactly. And so, I, I guess everybody that's still voting Republican or Democrat, you've been duped. Yeah, like you have to you have to look at this and understand now that the guy who says he represents your ideology, even if the Republican Party or the Democrat Party represents your ideology and what it expresses, yeah. you have to see that the people that are actually making those votes, they don't believe in that. No. And they don't care about you. Yeah. And all you're doing is allowing this to continue by continuing to vote for one of those two major parties. Find something else. Yep. Let them know that they can't keep doing it this way. And I don't even care if it's the Libertarian Party. If you're on the left and you want to support the Green Party, go support the Green Party. Yeah. Um, if you're on the right and you want to support the Constitutionalist Party or whatever that thing's called, yeah. go support the Constitutionalist Party. I don't think the Libertarian Party is really for the people on the right or the left necessarily. And I don't mean that you shouldn't vote for the Libertarian Party. I think that it's not it's not on that continuum. Exactly. It, it's, it's, it's like it's its own thing. It is. It, but it has something to offer the both sides. Absolutely. Depending on what you're looking for, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so. Really, individual freedom is the answer. And, and another thing that we talked about on the last podcast of that difference uh, between the collectivist and the individualist perspectives everything is defended by the individualist perspective the collectivist what I, I tried to express last time and i don't know if i succeeded is that the collectivist perspective allows the individual to be completely oppressed yeah in pursuit of the greater good for the greater number but the greater good for the greater number is actually achieved yeah. through protection of the individual yeah that's how the greatest number get the, the greatest good, is yeah. protection of the individual. Individualism is the answer. Yeah. Individualism is what allows you to make your own choices about your life, to decide what's best for you, to do... And, and the truth is that if the government's not a part of that market system where they're picking winners and losers, the way to win in a market system is by appealing to as many people as possible, by offering the greatest good or the greatest service at the lowest price, yeah. one way or another. I mean, there's different ways to answer that. Like, okay, maybe you don't have the lowest price, but you have the best good. Some people would prefer that. Yeah. Whereas maybe you don't have the best good, but you got the lowest price and some people would prefer that. But however it is that you get to that, however it is that you get to that, the way to achieve success in a, in a true free market system is by appealing to the most people, by actually providing people what they need and want. Yeah, absolutely. And the only way to get there is through a, a system that, that recognizes and respects and protects the individual, yeah, not groups. Yeah. Freedom is the greater good. Yes. Anybody that tells you, they, you oh, we got to do this for the greater good, just remember, freedom is always the greater good. <laughs> so. We're going to run long. All right. <laughs> What else do we got? Oh, we um, still got to talk about... Oh, we hadn't even got into war yet. <laughs> no, we haven't gotten into war. We're not going to really talk very much about war. I, do you want to do that first or this other story that maybe people don't really know? We should, All right, let's we do should the war probably not end on war, so... <laughs> okay, well, I don't know if the, uh, the other... The alternative is a good way to end either. Well, but It's right. not war. <laughs> we'll, we'll play our old buddy, Lindsey Graham. Your old buddy. <laughs> Uh, just, uh, yeah. 
threw up in my mouth a little there. <laughs> um, and it's not because of the whiskey. Oh, well, whiskey keep it is great. Keep, keep it in your mouth because I'm a sympathy puker. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So um, Lindsey Graham has been on this uh, atom bomb thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because that's He's not... He's saying it everywhere. Everywhere. He's all over the place with it, and he thinks this is a winning subject. Yeah, so he this is on a, in a Senate hearing. He's talking to Austin and Brown. Okay. Um, and pressing them about not giving giant bombs to Israel. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just, I'm just going to play the whole clip. So you can listen to this ghoul for two minutes. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> and then we'll we'll talk about what maybe the proper answers would have been. All right. <laughs> now, you just confirmed that, there, that, that we're delaying transfer or stopping transfer of certain weapons like 2,000-pound bombs to Israel. Would you have supported dropping the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, General Brown, in World War II? Well, Senator, I think it's just based on the situation where the... Well, we know. I mean, it's happened. We know. <laughs> I'm not asking. that They did it. Do you think that was disproportionate? It, it was uh, It was de- definitely... Uh, well, well do, you, do you, in hindsight, do you think that was the right decision for America to drop two atomic bombs on the Japanese cities in question? Well, I'll tell you, stop the World War. Okay, I mean, well, so we had a... Do you agree, General Austin? If you'd been around, would you say drop them? I yeah you know, I agree with the chairman here. It, I mean I mean if you were if we go back in time says hey we got two atomic bombs should we drop them what would you say? Well you know I think the leadership was interested in in curtailing the well what's what's Andrew, what's Israel interested in? Do you believe Iran really wants to kill all the Jews if they could? They, the Iranian they, regime yeah. They, they, do you believe Hamas is serious when they say we'll keep doing it over and over again? Do you do you agree that? They will if they can. I I do. I'm yeah, okay. Not, right. Do you believe that Hezbollah is a terrorist organization, also bent on the destruction of the Jewish state? Hezbollah is a terrorist terrorist organization. Okay. So Israel's been hit in the last few weeks by Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas, dedicated to their destruction. And you're telling me you're going to tell them how to fight the war and what they can and can't use when everybody around them wants to kill all the Jews? And you're telling me that if we withhold weapons in this fight, the existential fight for the life of the Jewish state, it won't send the wrong signal? I would just like to say Mike had to go pour another drink after listening to that clip, by the way. Just, just so everybody knows. Yeah. <laughs> just to get through it, like it was, it was that bad. Well, this is low-proof whiskey. Well, there, uh, there's that too, but I'm used to much higher proof. Yeah. I, I don't know. Oh, God, I really, I really despise Lindsey Graham. And there's some things that are, that are interesting to me about his performance there. Cause initially I thought that's really what it is. Like his, yeah. his like, because these guys grandstand, especially yeah. when they're in these type of things in Congress, like they're really there to kind of grandstand. Yeah, I'm like, is this outrage real? But then I listen to the emotion in his voice, and I think it might be. I think it is. Um, I mean, he really believes this. He's a true believer, um, which is just even scarier. It is. I just it boggles my mind that somebody can be so passionately wrong. Like you, you've just, you've chose this wrong path and like, you're so into it. Yeah. And it's it, not it, going to give. Yeah. Just yeah. not going to like, because of all people, like he knows the facts on the ground. Like he knows as much of this about, as we do. He's mm-hmm. just determined on the wrong path. Well, th- there's a couple of ways. First off, let me say, no, I don't believe that Iran is intent on killing all Jewish people. No, and now I will go as far as to say that they wouldn't mind it. Well, now uh, they used to be allied against Iraq. Yeah. Um, but then Israel decided that the better path was to uh, to to fight on the outside instead yeah. of fighting the the guys that were right next to them. They would fight the periphery. Yeah. So there was a time when Iran and Israel were both opposed to Iraq. Do you remember the Iran-Contra affair? Yeah. Do you remember who was negotiating those sales back and forth? I don't. It was Israel. Oh, really? Okay, I didn't know that. (laughs) All right. Yeah, Israel was the middleman on the negotiations with Iran. Yeah. 
Anyway, so but, there was a time when they were on the same side, but then they decided that instead of fighting the nations that are on our, our that are our neighbors, we should ally with our neighbors and fight the periphery. Yeah. That hasn't exactly worked either, but... No, but at any rate, given the current situation, I'm sure Iran wouldn't mind getting rid of getting rid of Israel. But the truth is, is the power dynamic would never allow for that anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the other one was the... Uh, is Hamas intent on doing this over and over again? Do you think that they would do it again? Whatever, I, I can't remember exactly his wording there, but yeah. like, yeah, as long as the... The as they're oppressed Palestinians the way they are. are occupied people. Yeah, I suspect that they would. Yeah, it's, it is. It this is what irritates me about the situation more than anything mm-hmm. is that it's not taken to, into account what is being done to the Palestinians. Yeah. Do you think the slaves will continue to revolt until they're free? Yeah, I think yeah, they might. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Like I mean, that's it's it's really simple concept that that just is not understood. Mm-hmm. But here's what the two generals should have said. Well, okay, so the, so the first and easiest answer to the his very last question, are you going to tell them how to prosecute this war? As long as we're funding it. Yes, exactly. Well, okay, as long as we're paying for it and we're providing all this stuff, then yeah, I think that yeah. we can tell them how to prosecute the war. we got a right to, to, to have an opinion here. And if they don't want to listen to us, we don't have to pay for it. Yeah, there you go. So that's an easy answer. But on the atomic bomb thing, which is really the part that irritates me. Which is what he's going around parading right now. Yeah. And part of that is I think that he's trying to justify Israel's use of an atomic bomb in Gaza, which would be stupid anyway. Although I don't think that it's beyond them. But it would be stupid anyway because Gaza is in the southwest of Israel, which means that prevailing winds would bring any fallout across Israel. Anyway, it would be <laughs> it would be stupid, but yeah. I don't put it past them. Yeah. More likely they would drop an atomic bomb elsewhere, like Iran. Oh yeah, yeah. Um now and, he, and just to stop on that point for a moment. Um they've been attacked by the Palestinians, the uh by Hezbollah, by Iran, and all these people want them dead. Well, but Israel has been antagonistic towards all of those groups. They started things with Iran by dropping a bomb on their embassy complex in Syria. Yeah. Um, they were immediately fighting uh, into Lebanon after the attacks on October 7th. I'm not saying that Hezbollah wasn't a part of that yeah. in some way, um, but by all accounts, they were the aggressor there. They're the ones that started thinking, well, actually, I could be wrong about that. I know that Hezbollah was firing rockets into Israel, but I don't know. I don't know who the first shot, who took the first shot there. I don't know. Yeah. It could be either side, frankly. Yeah. Um, but the idea that the the Palestinians were the aggressors just pretends that history started on October seventh. Yeah. Like yeah. these are a people that are in, in, an occupied people that are already refugees that were driven off their land seventy years ago. Yeah. Like, there are already refugees in Gaza because the Israelis' uh, militias drove them off their land. Yeah. So who's the aggressor? I, I don't know. I yeah. mean, at some point, like, history's pa- too much history has passed, I guess. Yeah. You can't go back to the beginning. No. But at the same time, to pretend that... Okay, I'm not saying... that it's. I guess it's the same thing that I'm going to say that I said about Russia. It's not, I'm not saying that I approve of it or that it's justified yeah. what happened on October 7th, yeah. but I understand. Well, yeah. It's not like it wasn't, it, it's not like not it was like without it was reason. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely not unprovoked. Yeah. Um, I'm so tired which, of hearing that word. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the thing that boggles me here is, Okay, you know, the Israelis won a war in 78 or whenever it was. So they have, I guess that's right. That, um, 67. 67. Okay, they, 67. My bad. Yeah, I'm way off. Anyway, they won the war in 67. Um, they have all this land now. Something still has to be, and it should have been handled then, mm-hmm. done with the people that are refugees from that war. Yeah. Like, and that's something that should have happened then. 
Like, yeah. okay, what do we do with these people now that we've pushed them off this land? And you have to come up with something reasonable. It does. It can't just be what it has been. Where no, we're going to force them all into this one area and just terrorize them for kingdom come. Yeah, like that. That can't be the solution. And that's that's is what it has been up until now, which it still is. Yeah, I. We're. This is how we're. This is how we're. We don't actually make any money off of this so i guess i don't have to worry about being demonetized but this is the point where we're probably getting our <laughs> our stuff thrown off of youtube at the very least is that i hear a lot of people say nobody wants the palestinians the palestinians are terrible people and nobody wants them and so you know what does that say and the way i would respond to that is that the jews have been kicked out of 100 plus countries too yeah so it's like two groups of people that nobody likes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that they just need to figure things out. And yeah. the, the answer is a, uh, a state that isn't an ethno state that, yeah. you know, allows all people to have citizenship and the same kind of rights. Like yeah. then you wouldn't have as, I mean, I'm not going to say that there's going to be no conflict it, at that it, point because well, there's a lot of grudges. Well, at this, at this point, point, at this point, there's a lot of grudges. And I'm yeah. not even saying that there wouldn't have been after 78, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't be to the level of 67. 67. God, why do I keep saying 78? Because 48 is when the Nakba happened. Okay. I gotcha. And there was another yeah. war in 73. Yeah. But 67 is really when is, all is this what, is what we're talking captured. about. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there would have been, but but it's now it's done festered for all of this time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there's yeah, a lot of resentment. Even when even when you do give the Palestinians their own state, it ain't gonna be roses at first. Mm -hmm. But it's something that to me, it just has to be done. Yeah, I mean, you're certainly not moving past this without it. I mean, I, I think yeah. that I think that a single state would be fine if they actually gave equal rights. Yeah, and it, so forth. it would still I mean, take some time, but it would, yeah, it would take some time. I mean, it took some time in this country when well, the slaves yeah. were freed. It's yeah. it took some time for everything to kind of settle to down. Settle out, yeah. But we're okay. Well, we were okay until a few years ago. Anyway, I, yeah. I don't know. things have oddly enough taken a step back. Yeah, but um, but here's the other thing: that those two generals should have said and should have known. Yeah, maybe they didn't, but I hope that they knew about this. Yeah. Is that Six of the seven five-star uh, military leader, generals, admirals at the time yeah. um, that the bomb was dropped yeah. criticized the use of the bomb. Yeah. I mean— This was not exactly a popular thing that happened at the time, yes. at least as I remember it. The, I the mean, military, I wasn't there, but as I've studied. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The military leaders were mostly opposed to it. Yeah. Even uh, Bombs Away LeMay— <laughs> um, who organized the firebombing of uh, Japan, Yeah, was initially opposed to the bomb, although he did come around and support it. Let, yeah. you know, but um, there were both moral and strategic arguments against it yeah. from the military. This was not a military decision. This was a political decision to drop the bomb. Yeah. It was not a military decision. Um, and we're talking about uh, Admiral Leahy, said in his memoirs that he was opposed to it, that he said that Japan was ready to surrender without the bomb, um, that killing women and children is not how you win wars. Um, and that guy was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time. Yeah. All right? So the most important military leader in the country was yeah. opposed to the dropping of the bomb. Dwight Eisenhower was opposed to dropping the bomb. Um, Admiral Halsey was opposed to dropping the bomb. That was a Pacific Theater uh, Navy um, admiral. Yeah. Like, there were lots of people that were opposed to the dropping of the bomb. Yeah. And the decision was made, as far as I can tell, I, I mean, I guess th this isn't definitive because you can't know what's in anybody's head exactly. Yeah. But I, I really believe at this point, because the military leaders were opposed to dropping the bomb. Even people on the ground in the Pacific Theater were opposed to dropping the bomb. Yeah. Um, it, it's been kind of lionized in history of the U S cause you got well, to justify that kind of activity, it has right? To be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you had to just, you had to work really you hard to just, propagandize and justify the, the deaths of a quarter million yeah. civilians. You can't just do something like that and be like, Oh, well, I guess we shouldn't have done that. <laughs> like <laughs> well, if yeah. you're the government, like, yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> um, 
But uh, yeah, I mean, there were moral objections. There were strategic objections. The, this was a political decision, and it was a political decision to show the rest of the world what we could do. Yeah. Well, and at the time, we were the only ones that could do it. Yeah, and particularly Russia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got this, and we ain't afraid to use it. Yeah. So Of course, there's also stories that we gave Russia the bomb right afterwards. And Oh, is that so, right? <laughs> yeah, but anyway... The, this was the this was the real issue. This was a political decision to show the world what our military was capable of to settle the question of who was the dominant power in the world. It was yeah. not about defeating Japan because Japan was defeated. Yeah, they had already sent people out trying to find a way to negotiate uh, a surrender. Um, the U.S. was intransigent about that the emperor had to be uh, eliminated. And Japan wasn't on board with that. No. Um, but all it would have taken was for the U.S. to say, you can keep your emperor, but the war is over. Yeah. Like complete and total surrender, except you get to keep your emperor, and the war would have been over without the use of the bomb, without yeah. another person dying. Yeah. And instead, we had to make a point. Yep. So that would have been the, the correct answer is yeah, like, there's oh, actually, no way Lindsey Graham would have let one of them guys spout that off. Well, by, that's true. by I mean, the he, way, <laughs> yeah, because he didn't let them answer much of anything. That's through that whole clip. He like every time them over he, and over, every time they started to make a point, he immediately interrupted them. Mm -hmm. um, angry old man. <laughs> that's down the wrong path. All right. I know we're over an hour, but I really want to hit this, this little ditty. Yeah. Little titty. Yeah. Uh, all right. So on Mother's Day, uh, President Biden gave Judy Shepard the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is, I think it might be the highest civilian honor that's issued by the executive branch. It's up there. It's up there. Um, and he gave her the Medal of Freedom for her LGBTQ advocacy uh, for the foundation that she started after her son, Matthew Shepard's death in 1998. Now, Matthew Shepard was tied to a fence post in Wyoming and beaten essentially to death. He actually died of, and left overnight in the cold Wyoming oh, wow. night. And he actually died a few days later in the hospital. And the story has been since then, the, the, the story that, the, that they've pushed over and over again is that he was beaten to death because of his life choice of being a gay man yeah. in Wyoming by these two guys, um, <clears throat> Aaron McKinney and uh, Russell Henderson are the two people that were convicted of his murder. And they're both serving yeah. life sentences. Yeah, well, good for them. Yeah, so... Justice has been served, I guess, as yeah. much as you can say. Yeah. Um, but there's a problem with this story. Now, this event has been used to to expand hate crime legislation all over the place, yeah. uh, giving more police powers, uh, better capabilities of prosecuting hate crimes, and so forth. This has been this has been a legislative bonanza for the police state. Yeah. Okay. But there's a problem. Yeah. Is that the story is that they, th these men so hated gay people that they tied him to a fence post and beat him almost to death with a, uh, with the butt of a pistol. Yeah. But the guy McKinney, um, Aaron McKinney was connected to Matthew Shepard, the victim in all this, um, by the drug trade. Yeah. And Shepard was supposed to receive like a ten thousand dollars shipment of methamphetamines in the days surrounding his murder. Yeah. Um. In addition, Aaron McKinney had a sexual relationship with Matthew Shepard, huh. so it seems unusual yeah. that the gay guy would beat the gay guy to death because he was gay. He's one of them self-hating gays. Maybe. <laughs> Could be. I mean, you know, um, they did try to put up some weird defenses in the murder trial about this, that like he was, uh, you know, he, the, you know, this weird kind of defense about that he was so put off by the come on from Matthew Shepard that he lost his mind and beat him to death. You know, I mean, some weird stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, but this, 
this was just a defense strategy and it wasn't even, they didn't even let them use it. Oh, really? um, yeah. But as the story has come out, as the investigation has come out, one of them was in a homosexual relationship with the guy that was beaten to death and both were somehow connected through the drug trade with this guy. Yeah. And in a, um, in an interview from prison, the other guy, uh, Russell Henderson confirmed that the, the murder was about, or the beating, I, I don't think that they actually intended to murder him, but, no. but that the beating, um, was about, uh, um, drugs and money. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that was the motivation. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't have anything to do with him being gay. Yeah. Now it's a terrible loss and a tragedy for this woman, no matter what. Absolutely. No. But I, I think it, I think it's a disservice to the people that are actually oppressed to use this story that's just untrue. Yeah. Um, this guy, in all likelihood, was not attacked because he was gay. He was attacked because he was a drug dealer. Yeah. And had a dispute with his underlings about money. Yeah. That's what it looks like. Yeah. Now... We could take this in another direction and say this is a good reason to end the drug war because yeah. this kind of murder, this he probably wouldn't have been murdered if drugs were legal. Yeah, yeah. I'm not so. a big fan of methamphetamines personally. I have no, some like experience with people that have lost was their unpleasant. mind with them. Yeah. Um, but all the same, this wasn't about him being gay. This was about in a, a black market trade. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of thing happens on the black market, unfortunately. Yeah. Because there's no legal recourse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you got to handle it somehow. You know, the, the guy screws you over on your drug trade. You can't take it to the cops. Yeah. yeah. So Vigilante justice. Yeah. That was a terrible thing to say. Sorry. It's not really vigilante justice. It's no, it, it's not. But, it's not justice in any way. But it, especially in this circumstance, it's quite the opposite. But, mm -hmm. um, but that's the reality, you know. But I just get frustrated with them pushing these kind of narratives. Um, so, so the what used to be Beauty and the Beta and is now the Matt and Blonde Show, which is such a boring title. They should go back to Beauty and the Beta. I will always call it Beauty and the Beta. <laughs> it's just a better title. Yeah. Come on, guys. <laughs> anyway, um, they were discussing this also, but uh, which is how I heard about it originally, I think. And then um, I didn't know about the uh, the Presidential Medal until they brought it up again yeah. um, last week, I guess. But they have a regular segment on their show called The Hoax Hate Crime of the Week. Yeah. Which is where this came up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which, which I imagine they have a, a lot of stories for. Oh, yeah. There's a for. plethora. Yeah. Um, sometimes you don't always know that it's a hoax crime, but most of the time it turns out to be. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the uh, just uh, juicy small yay fashion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's just ridiculous that you can get away with this. And the, the truth is that you don't need the hate crime because... These people were convicted of murder. As they should have been. As they should have been. And sentenced to life imprisonment. Yeah. What does tagging it as a hate crime fix anything? It doesn't do anything. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Murder is wrong because murder is wrong. Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the motivation is. Exactly. So, All right. so we should close out there because we're already running really long. This is like an hour and 15 minute episode. Woohoo. Got a big one tonight. Yeah, people are excited. Um, <laughs> you so, think over an hour is a bonus. Yeah, right. You can turn it off in an hour. So. I'm telling you that now, an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, but don't remember that for the future. <laughs> so I guess we won't be here next week. Yeah, you'll um, be gone. Because I'll, yeah, I'll be gone. Um, I was thinking that we could try and arrange something on Wednesday, but I don't think that we can really, can we? <laughs> Bless you. Ah, oh, excuse me. Uh, Wednesday would be tough. Yeah. So. Me too. I mean. I mean I I'm leaving the next morning. I wouldn't say that we'd, we're rolling it out, but it's a long shot. Yeah. Put it that way. And I thought about taking stuff up to D.C. and, 
and trying to get an interview or do something up there. But I don't think I want to do that either. Because the truth is that I couldn't really, I couldn't really post it. I mean, I probably don't have time to put things together. Yeah. And it's like another box of stuff that I don't want damaged or lost that I'm yeah. taking on the plane. Yeah. You're rolling them dice of it getting lost, yeah. particularly. <laughs> yeah, I got bad luck with luggage, so. Um, yeah. Take that in your carry on. Yeah, I did. Um, GI Greg actually did give me a, a foam box to like put all this stuff in. Yeah. But I haven't arranged it to put all this stuff. In. <laughs> so that's something else you'd have to do before yeah, you left. One more thing to do before I leave, which I'm probably not going to do because I'm lazy. Yeah. So I guess we're taking a week off. Looks that way. Got one in the can we can throw out. We could, but again, I'd, it would be hard for me to post it up there. Up there. Throw it up Wednesday. I don't want to do Early. that. Yeah, I don't want to do that. We're just going to skip a week. Okay. We're just going to skip a week. Well, you know, we provided at least 20 <laughs> minutes of extra content in this episode. So just yeah. think of this as like next week's bonus. Yeah, there you go. Or a bonus for next week. Yeah. Or something. Um, we could divide this in half and put half of it up. No, no. <laughs> no we're not okay. doing that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> All right. So uh, next week off, we'll be back um, after that, uh, yeah. the end of the month. With with coverage from the Libertarian yeah, Party yeah. Convention. Yeah, yeah. There will be a review of the um, Libertarian Party Convention or of D.C. wherever I spend my most time. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. I, I really hate I can't go. Like, I'm... I'm yeah. Well, you haven't gone yet, man. You really no, got to no. do one of these things. They're yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, cool this, people. This it's one, like really easy to meet people that you like have seen. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, it's yeah. really easy to meet like the Dave Smiths and the Tom oh, Woods. Yeah. And the, the, like, yeah. um, man, yeah. the first one I went to, I spent like an hour talking to, uh, the, the Michaels from the 10th amendment center, yeah. um, and Tom Woods and like Tom Woods had walked up and just kind of joined the conversation and I hadn't noticed. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so that's pretty awesome. Yeah. The legend himself. Yeah. Um, and, uh, there's a, uh, oh, so once again, anybody who's going to be there, you can contact me, Michael at the Liberty Mike.com. Um, let me know if you're going to be there. I'm also going to the Dave Smith's, uh, Dave and Robbie's comedy show the Thursday, I think it is the 23rd. Okay. Um, so if anybody's going to be there, uh, let me know. Um, we can meet up. And I'd be happy to do so. And I actually know my way around this part of D.C. a little bit because my brother lived there for a long time. Yeah. And at the very least, we can go to the Blackguard, which is was his like local bar. Um, and they may still remember him because he's <laughs> he's quite the character. memorable. <laughs> yes. uh, and uh, and that'd be fun. There's some good restaurants around there and so forth. Like I'm I'm looking forward to this. I think this is going to be a really good time. So anyway, if you're going to be there, you want to meet up with me, let me know. Michael at the Liberty Um, contact me. We'll do something. Go have a drink. And, uh, you yeah, can tell him how it. he's wrong about everything. He loves to hear that. Who? You. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll set yeah, this, you straight. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. You think so? <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. I'll, no, I love, I I love talking to people that disagree with me. Yeah. Well, so if you disagree like, with him, if you heard anything here tonight that you don't think's quite right. Yeah. I like, seek out the people that disagree with me yeah. everywhere I am. I, I, I do. I enjoy, I like understanding why people think the way they think. And I, I like trying to understand why people think differently from me. Um, and I sometimes actually, they can convince you otherwise. And right? sometimes they can convince me otherwise. Uh, yeah. It happens. I, I have certainly shifted my position. Jacob Hornberger converted me on immigration. Converted you're wrong, but we'll let that slide. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> well, I, obviously not. <laughs> um, I maintain that you guys are not paying enough attention to the long-term effects of giving the government to power to control the border in the way that you want it controlled. <laughs> Maybe. Well, I mean, when has giving the government power over anything benefited you? It's fair. I'll concede that. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> what we don't want to... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're, we're fixing to really get into some, yeah. so we should probably wrap um, it up. So, uh, yeah, okay. So we won't be back next week, but we'll be back the week after that. I'll be in D.C. next week. Um, so let me know if you're going to be there. Uh, I would 
love to meet people. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll be back the week after that when we finally get things right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.